the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. This is Hope for Today. Hope for Today, the Bible teaching ministry of David Hawking. The Word of our God shall stand forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. Uh, take your Bibles and go to, back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, by the way, in our last session about the uh, Holy Spirit being the restrainer, since He's God and we can't flee from His presence, according to Psalm 139, 7 to 10, if we ascend into heaven, He's there. If we make our bed in the grave, He's there. And since the Holy Spirit is everywhere at once and fills the universe with His presence, then how is He removed out of the world? And uh, the answer really is that His presence in the church, for we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, is what is removed. So you understand the answer to the problem in 2 Thessalonians 2 is the fact that the church is gone. What really restrains evil, in my opinion, is the church. Have you noticed the hostility growing towards Christians? Have you noticed what's happening? It's getting more serious, it seems, with every passing day. We're the problem. The Club of Rome, which is um, kind of a sophisticated intellectual group that studies futuristic things, the Club of Rome, in one of its uh, more recent meetings, in fact stated that the number one pro problem to true global progress, as they said, are fundamentalist Christians who take the Bible literally. You see, we're seeing this on every level in society. Uh, we're the idiots. I was introduced at a meeting of the Orange County Association of Psychologists and Psychiatrists. You may wonder why they asked me to speak. Well, I think they have had some boring meetings and they needed some entertainment. But anyway, they asked me to speak to them and to show them the differences between biblical counseling and uh, regular professional counseling. They even use the word professional for what they do, but biblical counselors, of course, is not professional. But anyway, uh, the speaker introduced me as a fun damn mentalist. Fundamentalist. Very hostile group. About 125 people, only a, one that I knew that was a Christian. It was very, I love those kind of things. They're just lots of fun. <laughs> you know, songs come to my mind like, Nearer my God to Thee and Lord, I'm Coming Home. You know, things like that. <laughs> but it, it was a great time. And uh, someday I'll tell you about that. It was really kind of a funny time too. But uh, there is a growing hostility. And didn't Jesus say that? Yeah. If they hated me, they'll hate you. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. And didn't he say that in the last days, perilous times would come? And didn't he also say that evil men would wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived? And didn't he say that iniquity would abound? And didn't he say that the love of the majority, the many, would grow cold? It just seems too contemporary to not see that we're in that time. And again, I think the Holy Spirit being removed out of the world can only mean one thing, because he'll certainly be active in regeneration uh, saving the multitude of Gentiles who get saved in the tribulation. The Holy Spirit will still be there. Then how is he removed? Only by the church being removed. And I think the fact of our exiting out is going to open up the terrible dungeons of sin in this world like the world has never seen. It's going to become more ugly and crass than it ever has been. We are still the salt of the earth. Praise the Lord. But if the salt loses its savor, what good is it? Good questions for all of us to think through. Well, let's take a quick review. What have we studied so far? The lines of evidence regarding the church being taken out of this world at the rapture of the church. What are they? Well, one is the purpose of the day of the Lord, the tribulation. We talked about it as it relates to Israel, as it relates to the world, as it relates to God. And in reference to the church, there is no purpose. In all the writings of the Apostle Paul, 
There's not one bit of instruction concerning enduring this period of time. Very strange, don't you think, if we're going to go through it, that God didn't help us to understand what to do in the midst of it. The second thing we looked at was the symbolic parallels of believers escaping the judgment of God. And that principle of 2 Peter 2, 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of trials. Just like he delivered Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah, like he delivered Noah, and like he delivered Rahab, and like he delivered John, maybe also in John experience and his words in Revelation 4, 1. Then we looked at the presence of 24 elders in heaven, all during the tribulation period. We mentioned how they cannot be the angels, they cannot be Israel, because there's still uh, Jews who are going to be saved at the end of the tribulation. Uh, they are separated from the great multitude of Gentiles in Revelation 7, the number 24, referring to a completed group, but they're not called priests, they're called elders, the term for the leaders in the local church. We believe it refers to the completed body of the church in heaven. They sit on thrones, they're clothed in white garments, they wear crowns on their heads. All of it said of church age believers. Then we also mention the new song. Thou hast redeemed us to God. Yet modern translations put them in there to act like they're singing a song about the multitude that's getting saved. No, the evidence is strong for the King James rendering. We've been redeemed. And so the evidence is that there's a blood-bought, purchased group, a completed body of people in heaven that are not angels, not Jews, not the 144,000, not the Gentile believers in the tribulation. It's the church of Jesus Christ. They're in heaven all during the tribulation. Then we mentioned the fourth line of evidence is the unanswered problems if the rapture doesn't occur before the tribulation. Like Gentile believers alive and remaining under the coming of the Lord. But apparently, according to Revelation, they're all killed because they don't take the mark of the beast. We talked about the problem of the recognition of the day of the Lord. Unbelievers don't know the day, and neither do church-age believers know the day. But tribulation believers do. So we got an inconsistency if the rapture doesn't come before. Uh, we talked about also the um, um, matter of um, resurrection. Uh, the resurrection of the Old Testament believer apparently is 75 days after the Lord comes at the Battle of Armageddon. So it doesn't match with what the rapture says, that the dead in Christ are raised first, and we in fact are caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. So we have a lot of problems, really a lot of problems. And then uh, the fifth thing that we brought to your attention, hopefully, uh, were the predictions of Paul in the Thessalonian letters. And that is a very tough section that we went through. I'm sure many of you felt that way when we were going through it. But the resurrection of dead believers, again, is an issue because the resurrection was not unknown to people. That was taught in the Old Testament. So, But they were ignorant of the fact of the resurrection as it's associated with the rapture, something that was brand new to them. And it doesn't make sense unless, in fact, there is a strong difference between the rapture and the second coming at the end of the tribulation. Paul also said that they know perfectly about the day of the Lord, but they didn't know about the rapture. Well, if they know perfectly about the day of the Lord and His coming at the end, why wouldn't they know about it? So the fact of them not knowing about the rapture proves also that it's at a different time. Uh, we also notice that they who don't escape uh, the day of the Lord that comes on them like a thief of the night is not the ye who are of the day. And we who are the ye are not appointed to wrath. We're not appointed to the day of the Lord's judgment. I mean, it's hard to get out of this. Then we talked about the removal of the restrainer, a very difficult problem in 2 Thessalonians 2. Because according to the Bible, the removal of the Holy Spirit allows the man of sin to take his seat in the temple. And uh, it can't be synonymous with the rapture, because this event won't happen until the middle of the tribulation. we got a lot of problems related here. Well, let's come down to number six line of evidence. And that's the place where we meet the Lord. Oh, this is so simple. But it is so powerful. Right, you got your Bible open, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. The place where we meet the Lord. Where do we meet Him? Verse 17 says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, those who are dead in Christ who are resurrected, 
caught up with them in the clouds. The is not in the text. They're not rain clouds. It's the clouds of glory, the Shekinah glory of God. Could be anywhere. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But we meet the Lord. We come to this meeting of the Lord, one He has planned for us. And it is in the what? In the air. But Isaiah 63 that we studied earlier says the Lord comes to Basra, the capital, ancient capital of Edom, where the military men tell me that's where you would assemble major military armaments and soldiers to attack Israel if you were going to. Israel's most vulnerable point. And eventually, according to Zechariah 14.4, his feet after the battle of Armageddon will stand on the Mount of Olives. So here, the location is wrong. Let me show you something else. Turn back to John 14. John 14. The night before Jesus went to the cross, he made some interesting statements to his disciples. In John 14, he said, In my Father's house are many mansions. Verse 2, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. It possibly does not mean he's building that mansion, because apparently it's already done. It may mean that he's preparing a place, referring to his cross. I'm going to go die, preparing a place for you now to be with me. But that's another subject. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. There's the promise of the Lord himself. And receive you unto myself. Now watch this. That where I am, there ye may be also. Now, according to the book of Revelation, where is Jesus all during the tribulation? And the answer is he's in heaven. He doesn't come back till the end of the tribulation. Now, Jesus said, where I am, there ye may be also. If he's in heaven, I expect to be in heaven. Hello? Everybody understand me? And also, isn't it true that all dead believers are absent from the body, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, and present with what? The Lord. Then they're in heaven. So how do we get a completed church on earth during the tribulation? It's impossible. Why? Dead believers won't be there. You see, people, they stretch something to try to prove a point. It's totally unnecessary. The fact of the matter is that we meet him in the air and we're going to be with him. And like every Jewish wedding at the engagement, we go to the bridegroom's home. His home is heaven. We'll be in heaven during the tribulation. At the end, when all the attendants go out to meet the bridegroom and they hear he's coming to the bride's home, they go out, they meet him, they come back to the home. You can see that wedding procession in the Song of Solomon, by the way. And they come back home and they celebrate. That's at the bride's home where you have the marriage supper. Again, the pre-tribulational rapture view fits exactly all of the kingdom parables as well. When we are married to Jesus Christ in the official ceremony of the marriage supper, it's on earth. The Old Testament believers will be there. John the Baptist called himself a friend of the bridegroom. He'll be there. But the church is the bride and he will introduce her to the world. All the believers of all the ages will be there. It will be on earth to begin the kingdom of heaven, which is likened unto a Jewish wedding, according to the teaching of our Lord. So again, it just matches perfectly to understand the rapture. We go to the bridegroom's home. Then at the end, we come to the earth. The marriage supper of the Lamb is on earth, not in heaven. And all Old Testament believers will be there to, to begin the millennium, and we will rule and reign with Christ. Now, one other thing, at the rapture, he comes for his saints, but at the revelation, if I'm reading my Bible correctly, he's coming with his saints and with all the holy angels. Let, let's just take a look at that again. Matthew 25. I want to make sure I'm not just quoting something you can't see for yourself. Matthew 25, verse 31. It says, when the son of man shall come in his glory... That would be at the end of the tribulation, the manifestation of his glory on earth. When he comes in his glory, all the holy angels with him. That's what it says. Then he'll sit on the throne of his glory. 
That's at the end of the tribulation when he judges the nations and sets up his kingdom. Very interesting. He comes with all the holy angels. Now go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. In speaking about the coming at the end of the tribulation, it says, verse 7, To you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray also for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and all the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now, having said that, we're looking at Christ coming at the end of the tribulation. All the holy angels are with him. Go to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. Now here it describes that second coming. He's coming on a great white horse. Verse 11. And it talks about his eyes being a flame of fire and on his head many crowns. By the way, let me give you a little word on crowns. Anybody here named Stephen? Anyone? All right. Two guys. Stephanos in Greek. Stephen means a crown. But I hate to tell you this, it's a dinky one. <laughs> it's a crummy little crown. Usually it was just some twigs, kind of what we call a laurel wreath. And the Olympic Games, if you want to race, they put that on the top of your head. Basically twigs. But there's another Greek word for crown. We have it in English too, diadem. And a diadem is just saying into English the Greek word. doesn't translate it. And it is something a lot greater than a Stephanos. It's interesting to me that when it says Jesus is coming, there are many crowns. They aren't Stephanos, they're diadem. There are many diadems on his head, which represents a sovereign authority of rulers and there are many, for he is king of kings and lord of lords. Anyway, it says his clothing is vesture dipped in blood. That's because he's just wiped out the nations of the world and their blood is all over his clothes. His name's called the word of God. Now look this. The armies in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Wow. Who are these people? Back to chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, the bride, has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed, here it is, fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of angels. Is that what it says? Oh, I'm sorry. The righteousness of the 144,000. No, I'm sorry, it didn't say that either. It's the righteousness of what? Saints, believers. We're coming with him. But yet at the rapture, we're going to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You see, the very place where we meet the Lord is so significantly different. You can't help but believe the rapture, which is a brand new thing, not known in the Old Testament. The resurrection of church age believers, not known in the Old Testament. But they did know about resurrection of the believers. Which means it has to be other than what they knew, or otherwise it isn't new. Everybody follow that? What a thing is, it is. What it is not, it is not. And they can't both be the same at the same time. Amen? Okay. Just, think, just keep thinking clearly. Now, we come to the last point, And this is my favorite one. And that's the specific promises to church age believers. I believe God has already told us that we will not go through the tribulation. In fact, I believe this so strongly, if you want to go through the tribulation, I think you need counseling. I really do. You must be nuts. You must not have read the tribulation. Where over half the world's population is killed, and there's 
plagues and pestilences like you can't believe, where the kings and captains and governors and leaders of the world are crying out to rocks to fall on them, to hide themselves from the wrath of Almighty God and His Lamb. Hey, folks, it's terrible time, tribulation. The worst time the world's ever seen. Uh, Isaiah the prophet had the world in the hands of the Lord, and he's literally shaking the globe. The greatest earthquake that has ever happened in the history of the world will happen. The Bible tells us all the cities of the nations will fall. There'll be volcanic eruptions everywhere. Uh, the whole topography of the earth's surface is going to be radically changed. And just to make sure you don't trust in it anymore, God's going to blow it sky high. Planet Earth. Everything in it. Believest thou this? It's going to happen. In fact, let's take a look at it. Second Peter chapter 3. I love this. Second Peter chapter 3. You know, we're living in a day when new age occultic thinking is very much into the environment and ecology. Save the plants, kill the babies, of course, but save the plants and the animals. Don't kill that little precious little animal and wear its fur. That's very bad. Because after all, we came from the animals. Why are we so surprised that people are acting like this? They've been teaching for years we came from the animals. You know, evolution. So, you know, we're actually, you know, doing it to ourselves because these precious little animals might become us. Have you heard about the second revolution in evolution? I'm not putting you on. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I would have told you it's a couldn't be. Scientific journal. One of the biologists who's an evolutionist, but he comes and listens to me. uh, He's at the University of California, Irvine. And he uh, gave this to me. He said, you know, I know you're not too hot on evolution. (laughs) That's the understatement. (laughs) But he said, as an evolutionist, I have to tell you, it's getting a little hard to believe it. Really? He said, Well, not because of your reasons. He said, I know you're a Bible person, and I don't yet believe the Bible is right. But he said, it is very interesting. He said, I just thought you'd be interested in this article. He hands me this article. These are academic people, friends. And the title of it is The Second Revolution of Evolution. What they meant was the first revolution is that we discovered that we came from the animals. Do you know what the second one is? I'm not kidding you. The article was all about it. The animals made us. They are the gods. You know what the proof of it was? In all the ancient archaeological discoveries of the various religions of the past, what do the leaders show themselves to be? Animal-like. They got heads like, you know, goats or, you know, uh, bears or apes or whatever. So they say all this mythological information is because there really was this situation. The animals are the ones that actually created us. And you want to go to college. <laughs> you know what happens with education? I got a lot of education. You know, you know what happens? You get educated beyond your intelligence. That's exactly what happens. Years ago when I walked off with my first doctor's degree, and I have three of them, and I'm not proud of it. I walked off with my doctor's degree. My oldest son was just a little kid, a little squirt at the time. And I came off with a robe and the diploma and all that, you know, walked off. And he looked at me and he says, what's that, Dad? I said, that's a doctor's degree. He said, does that mean you can heal people? I said, no, it's not that kind of degree. He said, then what good is it? (laughs) You know, I have lived to see the wisdom of that little kid's remark. It has nothing to do with anything. Some of the dumbest people I've ever known have PhDs. Wake up, people. You'll be smart in God's wisdom. You'll be just fine. Watch out. And I'm not down on education, obviously. I'm still teaching kids in college and all that. I'm not death on education. I believe you don't check your brains off the door, so don't you misunderstand anything I'm saying. But when you're not educated in the wisdom of God, you're going to get so stupid, you're going to start saying the same dumb things these people are saying. You've lost reality now. You're a never-never land. And you know, God told you that's what's going to happen. He's going to do it to your mind because you reject the only living God who made you. You Better settle down. I'm getting excited. (laughs) 
Look what's going to happen. Second Peter three. Verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In day of the Lord is day of judgment, darkness. We've already learned that, the tribulation. In the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise or roar. The particular word there is now used of thermonuclear explosions, by the way. And the elements shall melt. The word is luo, which means to loose, with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. The elements shall melt. This is the word meaning to to liquefy with fervent heat. You know, it's interesting to me that scientists have a tendency to catch up with the Bible. They literally do. And some of the terms that we use in the thermonuclear field are right here, the very Greek words. And we used to think of these as, you know, just pictures. And now we realize it's literal. We didn't even understand the matters that were in these verses until just a few years ago. But now we know that this can actually occur. And it's frightening, it's scary. And by the way, God won't need nuclear weapons to do it. His mighty power can do it far better than they could ever do it. And the world, they don't believe this. (laughs) A couple years back, a lady from the Orange County Register called Calvary Chapel and wanted Pastor Chuck to comment on Earth Day. And uh, (laughs) so I got the assignment to talk to her. You know, and I got on the phone with her and she said, uh, what are you guys going to do about celebrating Earth Day? I said, well, not much. Our pastor's just going to teach through the Bible like he always does. Just the next chapter, that's all I know. Well, aren't you going to have any special celebrations? No, I don't think so. Well, why not? Don't you care about the environment? I said, well, my daddy taught me to pick up trash. I still do that. She said, well, that's not bad. She said, well, you got anything else? I said, well, we got to stop using these and pesticides and all that. I mean, it's ruining our fruits and vegetables. And she said, well, that's pretty good. What else you got? I said, well, our water, boy, we have really got to clean the water up. Well, that's really good. She says, why aren't you going to celebrate? Aren't you for a good environment? I said, oh yeah, it's better than a bad one. I'm for it. Yeah. And she said, well, why aren't you going to celebrate it? And you know how you, you can't think it, you just, things come to your mind. And you know, I'm such a Bible person. They came to my mind. And so I said to her, I said, well, the reason we're not going to celebrate is because God's going to blow it sky high. <laughs> the si- you have to understand it. The silence on the phone seemed like an hour. I know it was only 10 seconds. She didn't say anything. And what came back on, because I just waited, what came back on was a woman stuttering. And she said, Did you do, 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 have any uh, uh, idea when it will be? <laughs> A lot of things are going to happen. But you know one of the most wonderful things in the Bible is specific promises God has given to us that clearly show us we're not going through the tribulation. No way. Go to 1 Thessalonians again, but this time to chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 10. Chapter 1, verse 10. The specific promises given to the church. This is really beautiful. Verse 9, to this new group of believers, he said, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now everybody knows about hell. But there's a definite article in front of the word wrath in this passage. The wrath, the particular one. The day we all knew was coming. The one he discussed in chapter 5 and in his second epistle. There's no doubt what day he's talking about. The day of God's wrath. And the Bible says he's delivered us from that coming wrath. I believe God. I do not expect to be in the tribulation. In chapter 5, verse 2, he said, You know that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. 
But verse 4, you're not in the darkness, and this day should overtake you as a thief. And verse 9, God has not appointed us to wrath, that's the wrath of the day of the Lord, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful, wonderful promise. But you know, it gets better. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. This was a promise given to the church of Philadelphia. Seven churches. Some people think they represent all of church history. I don't know. I can't prove it. They certainly represent seven churches that existed in John's day, and I have visited all of these sites. And there's a lot of interesting things from an archaeological, geographical point of view to a lot of these. Philadelphia was chosen because it was an open door, geographically, travel-wise, to the whole world. Amazing to see that. Laodicea was chosen because God wanted to spew them out of his mouth and that water that flows over the limestone cliffs of Laodicea, I put my hands under and tasted it and it doesn't have to be hot or cold. It's so awful, you immediately throw it up the moment it comes into your mouth. It's so one of the most awful tasting things you've ever tasted. And all of a sudden that passage comes alive. But here in the church of Philadelphia in verse 10, we have this statement. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now there's a lot of of things in this verse. The post-tribbers don't like this verse at all. They basically teach that when he said he will keep you from this temptation or trial, it means immunity from that you'll still be in the tribulation, but he'll protect you. But that isn't true, because we're going to be killed if we're in the tribulation. Some protection. (laughs) There's a lot of things about this verse that interest me. First of all, the definite article, the, is in front of our, as it's indicated in your English Bible, but it's also in front of the word temptation or testing. It's the hour of the testing. We're not talking about any old temptation or testing. We're talking about a particular one. It also is interesting to me that this is worldwide. The only time the Bible ever describes such a worldwide testing is the tribulation period. He will keep thee from the hour of the trial which will come on the whole world. And it says the purpose of it is to try them that dwell upon the earth. Does that include the believers? No. All you have to do is look at the whole book of Revelation at the earth dwellers. That little phrase, those who dwell on the earth. And guess what? They all refer to unbelievers. The purpose of the tribulation is God is going to pour out his wrath against those who rejected him. The unbelievers are going to suffer immeasurably from God. How long, O Lord, do we suffer and the wicked prosper? How long till you avenge our blood? God's answer, now, tribulation, I'll show you. And God's vengeance will be poured out upon this world like this world has never seen. Interesting. But he said, I'll keep thee from it. Now the word from it doesn't mean immunity. It's the Greek word ek, which means out of. I will keep you out of this hour of this trial that will come on a whole world and test those who are the earth dwellers who have rejected me. I'm going to keep you out of it. Listen, I can't wait to get out of it. Paul said, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. But to be with Christ is far better. We're going to be out of here, people. We're not going to be here. Now, as I look at all this, I realize how important all the teaching is about this event. I am told, for instance, in 1 John 3, that it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then it says this, Every man that has this hope this blessed hope, resting on him, purifies himself, even as he is pure. 
Is it not possible that a lot of the sinful junk that's in our life is there because we do not live in anticipation of the rapture of the church? We think like a lot of people will think, according to the Bible at the end time, where's the promise of his coming? It's been 1900 years now. We kind of do our own thing, acting like, well, I, I've got time to get my act together. Really? No, you don't. There's nothing that needs to be fulfilled before the rapture if it's before the tribulation. Nothing. It could happen any time. Are you really purifying yourself as he is pure? John wrote in 1 John 2, warning us that when he comes, a lot of us will be ashamed at his coming. The word means to shrink back. Taken so much by surprise and embarrassed that it happened. Why would that be? Why would God say all the way through the New Testament concerning the second coming that we are to watch and be ready? I began to look at the word watch and ask myself, since it's used so much about the second coming, what does it mean to watch? Do we stand outside and look up in the sky? Oh, he's not here yet. You see him? No, I don't see him. No. That isn't the point. Watching is talking about being spiritually alert to sinful junk. If you really believe Jesus is coming back, if you really believe that heaven is your home, if you really believe all these wonderful promises of God, does it make any blooming difference in the way you live? Don't tell me prophecy isn't needed. It is greatly needed. What happens is the devil has undermined us to the point we think that getting our act together now is where it's at in church. I'm sorry, I don't believe that. In fact, I don't like going to church and hearing somebody talk about my emotional problems. I got plenty of problems. I like to go to church where my heart will be lifted up to praise the Lord. I don't want to be man-centered, I want to be God-centered. Don't tell me about man and how lousy he is and how he needs your counseling. Tell me about the Lord. The Lord is my hope. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and He is my salvation. I want to go to church and forget the misery of this week. I want to go to church and have my heart lifted to the Lord and know that He's alive and well on the planet. And my hope is not in this life. If it's only in this life, Paul said, we are of all men most miserable. Think about what the devil's done to us. We go to church wanting to be blessed. A lot of us won't even show up unless we are. How sinful and carnal can we be? We don't go to church to get blessed. We go to church to bless the Lord. It's at one time that we ought to focus on God and not ourselves. And many of the preachers of this land, they're not teaching through the Bible. They're telling us about our problems so we'll feel better. Sometimes I think we've been comforting the afflicted too long. We need to afflict the comfortable for a while. <laughs> you understand me? Things are not well in the church. They aren't well. We have Trojan horses everywhere. The Bible says, Blessed is a man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And I see the exact opposite. We're into anything and everything except God's word. There are too many things going on. What's on television? What's showing down at the latest movie? And all these things are dominating, controlling us. And we're not even thinking like we should because the expectation of the Lord's return is not really a reality with us. We're too busy thinking of other things. Was it not our Lord who said that the cares of this life and the uncertainty of riches will choke the word and make us unfruitful? The truth of the matter is no matter what you think the application or teaching of that passage is, the Lord has said it over and over again. Beware, he said, lest that day come upon you unawares. It's a trap, he said. The enemy's out there trying to defeat you. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he wants your mind to get off of prophecy. He does not want you to live in the light of our Lord's soon return. A lot of us put off our commitment to Christ because we think we have time. And yet concerning the rapture, he said in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, he made it clear that there won't be any time then to reconsider. Which brings us to probably the most serious issue related to the rapture. And that is, if you don't believe and commit yourself to Christ before the rapture, will it be possible for you to have a second chance in the tribulation because a multitude will be saved then? 
And my answer to you is, according to the Bible, no. How do you know that? Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. A lot of people say, well, I'll just wait, man. If I see all this and all the Christians are gone, then I'll know it's true and I'll believe in the Lord. No, you won't. You say, well, where do all these multitudes of Gentiles come from? They come out of nations of the world that have never heard the gospel. Revelation 14 makes it clear. The everlasting gospel will will go to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And God will use 144,000 Jewish evangelists to accomplish it. But if you have heard the gospel now, and you've been given an opportunity, and you have refused it or have just ignored it and haven't done anything about it, will you have a second chance? That's the issue. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, Then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Now watch this carefully. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, because they didn't respond to the gospel when they had the chance. For that cause, that reason, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Literally it's the lie, meaning the lie of the Antichrist that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. According to the Bible, if you refuse the gospel now, God will judge you for that rejection and send you strong delusion so you'll be deceived and you will not believe. You'll not be one of those who have never heard who come to Christ. You'll be one of those who be hardened because of your rejection of him now. Yeah, when you believe the rapture comes before the tribulation, it makes a big difference in a lot of areas. Not only in the purification of the believer's walk with the Lord that we clean up our sinful act, but also in the very fact of whether we're a believer or not. Turn to Matthew 7, and with this we want to wrap it up. Matthew chapter 7. It's what I call the awesome, tragic consequences. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus said, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Right off the bat, I know that it's not enough to claim to be a Christian. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many, notice he did not say few, He did not say some, he said many, a word that implies the majority. The majority of people who claim to be Christian, in fact, are not. That's not my evaluation, that's what Jesus said. Many, the majority, will say to me in that day, Lord, hey, these aren't just passive people in their profession, they're very active in what they do. Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Preached in your name. In thy name have cast out devils. In thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. He didn't say, I knew you once, but you lost it. He said, I never knew you. Let me tell you something, folks. These are some of the most serious words that are found in the Bible. The majority of people who profess to belong to the Lord in the last days, in fact, are not Christian at all. They've never really committed their lives to Christ. That's why I think it's very dangerous to kind of make it as simple as some people say we possibly can. If I would ask you, do you have to believe that Jesus is the Messiah of the Old Testament to be saved? It would be interesting to hear your responses. Yet the Bible says you have to believe that in order to be saved. John 20, 30 and 31. If I asked you whether or not you had to confess your sins in order to be forgiven by the Lord. A lot of people think you don't have to. Just believe in Jesus and he takes care of it. But he told us we have to confess our sins. There's a lot of interesting things like that. Do you have to believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus in order to be saved? Absolutely. 
Do you have to believe that Jesus died on the cross? For, can we just say he just died, man? He just died. No, no, no. He died for our sins. The purpose of his death is fundamental. He wasn't just a martyr. He wasn't just dying a victim of circumstances. It wasn't just an example of love, as so many liberal preachers say. No, he died for our sins. Do you have to believe he's God? Of course you do. Only God can forgive your sins. And the Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. There's a lot of serious issues here. And a lot of us take it so lightly. Hey, just say you believe in Jesus Christ, man. That's all that's necessary. What are you talking about? Or people say... I believe in Jesus with all my heart. Well, so what? That doesn't make it real. I can say I believe in Buddha with all my heart. You understand, it's not your faith that saves you. Whoever told you that? It's only Jesus Christ that saves you. Faith is simply the hand of the heart that reaches out and accepts what God has said. Faith is trusting what this book says about Jesus is the truth. And relying upon it completely. And resting your whole case and your future and your life on it. We don't just ask Jesus to come into our hearts. Try to make sure we have a ticket to heaven. You're not fooling God. And you're not fooling yourself either in those dark moments of your life. When you start doubting and questioning whether you really belong to the Lord. Listen, it is simple in one case. A little child can be saved. But it's complex in another one. God said in Second. Corinthians 11.3, I fear lest as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. There are some simple facts here, but why do we stumble over them? Because maybe we don't really believe them, or maybe we haven't walked through it, or we just want our ticket to heaven, or our motives are wrong, or we want to hang around with the Christians, or, you know, do church. Wait a minute. Are you really committed to Jesus Christ? Have you really confessed Him as your Lord and your Savior? You believe no one else can save you but Him. He who said, neither uh, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Peter said, neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Are you really saved? The Bible says to Christians, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. I'm not trying to threaten you or scare you or anything else unnecessarily. But we ought to really be scared if we're not saved. The issues are still heaven and hell and life and death. And somehow we've watered down the gospel to the point no one understands anymore. And we're living in that age where many who profess to be Christians, in fact, are not. They're just playing a game. They're just going along with it. Just to be a part of the group and to be accepted. My friends, these are serious things. And the rapture makes it very serious. There are two things, basically, that you and I are very uncertain about. One, we're uncertain about the day of our death. It's known to God, but not to us. And when we die, it's all over. And we're also uncertain about the coming of Christ. We don't know the day nor the hour. Has it made a difference? Let's pray. Father in heaven... When we read these things in your word, it causes all of us to think seriously about our own relationship to you. It's an awful thought that there would be people that we've known and thought were Christians who will not be with us in heaven. But you said the majority of people living in that last day are going to be like that. And that truly alarms us. Lord, I thank you For your grace, your mercy, your kindness, your love, your willingness to forgive us even though you know what we're like. How could anyone refuse you? I thank you, Lord, that you want us to be saved a lot more than we want it. You sent your Son and said that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. We see his compassion for lost people demonstrated over and over again. Remember, he said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And sometimes we don't want to repent of what we're doing that's wrong. We don't want to confess it. We don't want to acknowledge it. But we want to make sure we have a ticket to heaven. 
Show us, Lord, the hypocrisy of this kind of thinking. And I pray, Lord, that as we examine our own hearts, just thinking about these things, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would cause those who are unsure and insecure about this to right now settle this and commit their heart and life to Jesus Christ and confess him as their Lord and Savior. And it's in Jesus' wonderful name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.